with re specific respect to uh, California and Washington, there are pretty big differences about how these states have, have gone about it. Uh, Betty, before we started uh, here today, you mentioned that because of Colorado's experience mm -hmm. before uh, the ballot measure, they were perhaps a better position than Washington to uh, make a go of fully legalization? There were two main differences between Colorado and Washington beginning November 7th. One of them was that um, in Colorado, we had an existing regulated market. We had licensed dispensaries that could transition more easily into uh, from a, a medical use to a either combined medical and adult use or to pure adult use. So it, it was more like flipping a switch, a very heavy, complicated switch, but flipping a switch as opposed to building something from scratch. Uh, we also had an, uh, an, an intrinsic business interest. We had people who were who had reason to push that forward, but most importantly, we had deadlines set in Amendment 64 that required the government to move at a much faster pace than it might have otherwise. Um, we could have found ourselves in a position where Amendment 64 was never implemented fully if we hadn't set deadlines related to licensing and rulemaking and stores being open on January 1st of 2014. 502 didn't have those same kinds of requirements, and so here we are looking at a seven-month delay from when Colorado stores are first open, despite um, an apparent embrace of medical or of adult use cannabis in Washington that is much more robust than in Colorado from elected officials. Uh, Could I jump in on that? And what's what's really interesting, and, and I keep thinking about this when you talk about Colorado and Washington, and and with California as well, is with with every thing that happens with cannabis right now, there's a thread that, that goes years back. And it's really important to really understand what's happening. You constantly have to, you know, sometimes dig as far back as 40 years. It's not, it's, these things aren't just popping up overnight. Um, and, you know, one thing that I think a lot of people are unaware of is with, with Washington, as Betty was saying, Colorado did have that industry in place. And so they just kind of transferred over. And legislators in Washington were trying to do that. And they had this, this great big bill in 2011 that was working its way through the legislature and had actually passed, but then was gutted around the time that uh, the DOJ was essentially sending those warning letters to states saying, we will, you know, essentially we will shut you down, we will come after you. And the governor was terrified and gutted the bill. Had that not happened, they would possibly be where Colorado is. So, you know, and with, and there's always these sort of loops. Um, another good example is, um, when you look at Colorado and Washington, I don't know if this is true, we wrote this in the book, a few people said it, but you know, everyone looked at California as sort of, uh, when Prop 19 was going forward, a lot of the advocates were terrified, right? There was a sense of like, why is, why is Richard Lee pushing forward? We want to wait till 2012. And at the beginning, everyone was so hesitant. But in the end, even though it didn't pass, it became sort of a model about what works and what doesn't work. And you saw for the first time, you know, NAACP, in the same place as Leap, in the same place as uh, UFCW, you know, so you had, you saw these coalitions emerge. So again, when you look at, I, I believe with the direction that Colorado and Washington went, you guys were probably looking back to 2010 and, and seeing, you know, where do they go right and where do they go wrong, you know, and if, if, if Prop 19 didn't happen and fail, but still happen, things would have possibly been more difficult for you guys in 2012, or at least it seemed that way. So it's interesting always, you know, when we were working on this book to how far back we had to, to pull, you know, it's pretty constant. Everything kind of comes full circle. It's interesting. When I've spoken to, to legislators about uh, hemp versus marijuana regulation at the federal level, uh, it seems like those two groups broadly, because, you know, it's more agricultural, often red states are more concerned about hemp as a possible uh, crop and uh, more blue states seem to be uh, more uh, concerned with marijuana. Uh, it seems like those two sides really aren't talking to each other, even though they're regulated by the same statute. You know, there's a lot of, I think, room for communication be uh, between state regulators and, you know, senators and representatives um, regarding both, you know, cannabis for medical or social use and hemp, um, you know, for textile purposes or you know, whatever uses they might want to use it for. Um, I think there's, you know, as we were chatting about before, there's probably a real opportunity for more communication there. Um, you know, we write in the book that hemp is really a plant guilty by appearance. 
And I think that more people are starting to understand that. Um, and it's interesting to see the people who are emerging in the states that are emerging so quickly, I think, especially after the farm bill. If I could jump in, that's probably another good opportunity to, to again, look at history. You know, Kentucky, again, isn't coming out of nowhere and saying, you know, we love hemp. Kentucky was the hemp heartland back in the day, you know, when, when the United States was essentially becoming the United States, that whole region was full of hemp, it was rows and rows and rows of it. So again, it's, I think that's probably why, because the, the Western part of the country was not obviously involved in that. So, you know, that it, for them, it's sort of a, a history. It's a homecoming. It's so again, looking back at why Kentucky, why these red states. You named that chapter history repeating for a reason, I think. Yeah, after a propeller head song, <laughs> a lot of song references in the book. Uh, you know, Betty, with respect to uh, st the student movement for, I don't know how long you've been involved, but how has that changed in recent years? The, um, well, Students for Sensible Drug Policy, the organization which I run, was formed in opposition specifically to the Higher Education Act's provision, which disallowed students with drug charges to receive federal funding from college, which has disenfranchised thousands of young people from the opportunity to attend college um, through these various grants and, and whatnot. Um, our first 10 years, or, or a little bit, our first eight years, I would say, were really pretty heavily focused on repeal of the HEA or partial, partial repeal of that section of the HEA. And so we spent a lot of time talking about that particular piece. Over the course of the last six or, or eight years, we've shifted our focus away as we have seen partial repeal of the HEA toward more harm reduction policies for um, you know, broad drug policy reform uh, and specifically marijuana policy reform. So now we pay a lot of attention to things like um, equalizing marijuana and alcohol policies on campus so we aren't inadvertently encouraging students to drink because the uh, punishments for marijuana are so much harsher. Uh, working on marijuana policy reforms at the local state, at local and state level in particular. And for example, um, our students placed 18,000 phone calls into Colorado in support of Amendment 64 in 2012. We'll see more activity around these sorts of policy reforms uh, that are related to drugs and drug users themselves from the student movement in the future. Um, than those related to the HEA, because as these other prohibitions fall away, then we have to worry less about the, the strange laws that are built to support the drug war and prohibition and its disproportionate impacts on youth. Um, and one of the really exciting things about the future of the student drug policy reform movement is what we get to do in a post-prohibition world. I might be jumping ahead in the conversation a little bit, talking about post-prohibition world, but in a post-prohibition world, we get to have honest conversations with our youth about how drugs and drug use might impact them mm -hmm. and why they might uh, be better off waiting or better off uh, taking a, a, a more science, uh, an approach to all of this that's more informed by science. And perhaps, um, you know, engaging young people in prevention and intervention policies that will actually serve them as opposed to you know, result in laughable prevention policies like the, you know, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs commercial that's paid for by our tax dollars, but in fact does not help young people in any way.